What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheen Show here on Sherdog.com. And today I am looking ahead to 1162, the latest uh, edition of uh, the One Championship calendar, uh, which uh, visits uh, Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, the 21st of October of this year, um, with uh, we, uh, four MMA fights I'm going to look into here But there's also um, a, a lot of kickboxing and different things On this card as well So very very uh, exciting We talked about a lot about one championship Obviously in this show over the last while Doing the previews uh, and the reviews for it And um, you know I, I think you know There's been a lot of talk this week about one championship And obviously the uh, the financials coming out And everything like that And I know Chattery was on with Ariel And talked about that And it's a very interesting time for one championship Because I think you know, we, we know what they have done, I suppose, and, and the big investment they have made in the sport in Asia and in their promotion to obviously reach a point in the... I don't know, what the future, whether it's the medium term or the long term, to have a success in a certain sort of way. And I think to do that, you will have to have a successful product. And obviously I've been talking about that here, doing, you know, maybe more the technical breakdowns or the breakdowns of the card or the breakdowns of the, uh, you know, before and after the cards. And I saw Luke Thomas actually talking about it as well recently about how their product uh, has improved and has, you know, I, I suppose got to a level where people um, want to watch it or people care about it or people are getting invested in it. And as someone who has... May, you know, I always watched the bit of one, cha- bit of one championship. But it's on, uh, or it was anyway. It was previously on at very good times for me over here in Ireland. It used to be on during the day. You'd be flicking through the channels. You might even see it. It used to be on uh, on a TV channel here. It was always one that kind of uh, I stopped by and I watched. But obviously, over the last maybe six months or so, I've been wa- watching all of them, watching more constantly. And um, I would agree with what Luke has been saying. I think their product is actually like. Is really good and really interesting. And as someone who's not the biggest kickboxing or Muay Thai fan or, or grappling fan, to see, uh, what's he, Mikey Mushimichi, the last day, it was actually really fun. It was 10 minutes in the middle of the card. It didn't really bother me as a kind of a, an MMA kind of purist or whatever. The kickboxing in the kind of the middle of the card or even on the top of the card or the high level Muay Thai, I'm actually kind of getting into a little bit, <laughs> to be honest, even as someone who isn't, a, you know, admittedly not the biggest fan of that either or haven't been. I, I think what they're doing is actually really, really good. And then they're putting on, do you know what their MMA fights are? What I find very interesting now is that they have no names that you're going to see over and over, even in the cards coming up here, Reese McLaren or the, the next one, Daniel Williams. Obviously, no, you know, we, we know the John Lennon, but the Angela Lees or the Stam Fair Texas, people whose names you see now over and over in their cards every few weeks. Whereas in the UFC, it feels like if you see a fighter this week, you won't see the same fighter for another, you know, let's say six months. That's 20 cards or 25 cards down the line. That's a lot you know, that is really, that is really a lot of a gap between it. Whereas if one championship, you know, they're doing a card or two cards every month, you know, back to back kind of at the moment, maybe that'll change next year. I'm not sure what, what way they're planning it, but you see a fighter now, maybe you'll see him on the next card or maybe you see him on two cards on the line. It's not that far away. Now that is an advantage of, of obviously a promotion who don't do as many cards and to the disadvantage of a promotion who do a lot of cards. Now the UFC are doing pretty well. They're earning a lot of money and everything like that, but it does give an advantage to the promotion where, that we can get more invested in. Bellator have a similar thing. Cage Irish have a similar thing, but I think one championship definitely have that as well. And they have a very, very high level of fighter. So, I am, and when I say very high level of fighter, I, I watch a lot of these fights and I'm very surprised at the level of a lot of these people coming through and a lot of the people they've been able to sign. Obviously, they have, you know, very, very good scouts and things in Asia to get a lot of the best fighters uh, into one championship, maybe before they go somewhere else or before the UFC spot them, before the UFC sign them, before Bellator sign them or whatever. And they do a very, very good job of that. So it's very interesting times for one championship. And uh, I think to, to start off, I suppose, this preview, and obviously we'll be looking ahead to the next card as well uh, in the next couple of days, it's it's a very interesting time for him. Uh, on the 162 card, it's you know it's a very much a mix of, uh, of kickboxing and, um, uh, and MMA. I'm going to look in good detail here at the MMA uh, fights. 
In the kickboxing, you have in the main event Zhang uh, Piman against Jonathan Debella, um, Islam uh, Murtzaev against Nikki Holskin. Obviously, Nikki Holskin is someone who even I've watched <laughs> down through the years. A very, very exciting kickboxer. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Sitchai against Mohamed Boutsa is on this card as well. Um, in the featherweight Muay Thai, Jimmy Vienna against Nicholas Larson. You have the opening fight of the card then is uh, Chorfe uh, against Dennis Porich coming out of Canada. So, you know, good few Muay Thai fights there, but a good few uh, MMA fights as well. And you know what? I'm very excited about the MMA fights, watching uh, back some of the fights over the last couple of days to prepare for this. There is... Do you know what there is a lot of uh, on this specific card? There is a lot of um, grappling. It's a very, very, uh, maybe not grapple heavy card, but a lot of finishes via submission. In, uh, in, in the top MMA fight on the card, Reese McLaren, he has 15 wins, nine by way of submission. His opponent, Wyndham Ramos, five wins, three of them by way of submission. And we'll go down through the others as we go. But to talk about that fight, I suppose, first of all, uh, McLaren is is a very interesting guy um, in terms of like he's 31 years of age now. He's had 23 fights. He's fought some, you know, good guys down through the years. Beat Wei uh, we Ji in his last one. He's fought uh, Yuya uh, Wakamatsu in a number one contender fight. That was back in 20. 21 um but you know he's been around the scene now for a good while he's fought kevin belly and he's fought bibiano fernandez uh back in the day as well and fought bin win back in 2014 all the way back then uh, outside of one championship um and you know made his debut in 2010 very very experienced now and if you look at his fighting style it's it's exciting it's my sort of fighter. You know, he's a southpaw, switch stance, moving a lot on the outside. He throws with big power and he throws lots of shots as well. I know in his last fight, he had John Wayne Parr in his corner, so the kickboxing is going to be improving all the time. Lots of variation. Um, the one thing I would say about him, and I think his biggest issue, is that he almost throws so much he leaves himself open. You know, he throws too much. He... He could throw, you know, he's the sort of guy I think who throws 20 shots when 10 might be enough. Or, I mean, you know, he, he throws six shots when three might be enough. And it's always, I, I always think the worst thing in MMA is to be caught when you're expecting to catch someone. So you throw the one, two, three, four, five shot combination. And on number four, you're expecting to catch someone with five and you get caught. And you're kind of standing there waiting to throw five and six. I feel like that's McLaren's biggest issue. Now, if he catches you at one, two, and three, it won't, mo- might not make any difference because you might not have the ability to counter him. But when he is meeting good guys who do have that ability, it's v- that's where he can kind of get into trouble. And I think that's where he has the biggest issues. He's a very good double leg as well. Fantastic jiu-jitsu, as the submission record uh, would uh, say. Um... He's kind of the opposite then on the ground than what he is on the feet. He's methodical, he's strong, he's technical, very good passer. Very, and this is kind of a, a thing I will talk about on this card a lot. Very strong on top for a, a, a smaller guy, you know, a flyweight, a, a, a bantamweight sort of fighter. Very, very strong on top. And, you know, as I said, throws a lot standing. And it's not that he doesn't throw a lot on the ground or he doesn't uh, throw with ground and pound. But I think what he does, uh, methodical is the word. You know, he kind of waits and passes and uh, puts pressure when he needs and then strikes when he needs to. And is very, very smart. Very impressive with Reese McGarren. I think he's a really, really good fighter. And uh, his opponent, Win, uh, Winston Ramos, uh, you know, he's very, very good as well. One thing with him, and you'll see it the second you watch him, Left hooks, it's uh, and when I say now, oh, you know, this guy lands a lot of left hooks, you know, I might throw four or five round. He leads with like some people lead with their jab, some people lead with their leg kick, some people lead, you know, with backhands. This guy is just left hook, left hook, left hook, left hook, left hook, just throw literally throws it like a jab, non stop left hooks. Um, and it entices people in honestly because they're thinking this same shot is coming all the time. And we're going to come in. He's very good at landing it, though. That's the one thing. He actually lands it a lot. It, the, the one issue I think he has, and the biggest issue he has with it, is it makes him kind of very square. So, like, if you think about it, you're throwing the jab, you're making yourself longer. When you throw the hook, you're making yourself a little bit shorter. By definition, you're, you're hooking your arm or you're putting your arm straight out. And I think it kind of squares him up a little bit when he throws it so much. 
you know and that causes him to eat shots right down through the middle um and that's a big big issue for him i think it's the biggest issue especially as well when you're fighting someone like mclaren who throws so many shots now <coughs> maybe he'll cash mclaren with the number four being the left hook maybe that will happen but is he going to get beaten with the one, two, three before he's able to land uh, at the number four? That is a big question for me and very, very interesting here. As I mentioned, big blast double leg. Um, and he doesn't give up on a very good chain wrestling. Very, very good chain wrestling out of Winston Ramos. Doesn't really give up on it. Um, he's very strong on top. Great head pressure. Nice ground and pound. Very, very quick to take the back as well when he needs to. So... Uh, all in all, I think this fight is very much a grappler versus grappler fight, which probably turn into a striking match. And I, I think if it does, if it does turn into a striking match, I think McLaren is a way better striker. Really, I really do. Um, I, I think, as I said, I think he's more varied. Uh, I think he will cause Ramos problems down the center. Uh, I think he, you know, he is a, a good chin. He, as I said, that power. Working with John Wayne Power as well, I think he'll see that opening. I think he'll see the issues that Ramos has. I think he'll win that as as uh, a fight on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, in the standing room or in the striking room, if you want to put that. If it turns into grappler versus grappler, honestly, I'm not. I'm not too. Sh- I, I look. It's not that I'm not too sure. I think it's whoever gets the top position will win here, and, may, and maybe that's an easy thing to say. Um, the chain wrestling is going to be a big, big part of this because I think Ramos will go for takedowns I think he'll need to go for takedowns and if he can kind of win that chain wrestling battle uh, I, I think he'll I think he'll get on top and win the fight but if he doesn't I, I think it'll be very wise as well for McLaren to throw in a few takedowns if he is winning the striking get on top himself and win that sort of realm as well to take it away from Ramos you know it's a fight you can see going either way if Ramos can win the wrestling battle he'll win the fight if he can't, I think he'll lose the fight, whether that's McLaren winning the wrestling battle or the striking battle. So I, I think it's more likely McLaren wins the fight. My pick is, is going to be McLaren here. Um, Very interesting strawweight fight then between Alex Silva and Gustavo Ballart. People don't know Gustavo Ballart. He's a very interesting type of fighter. He's four foot eleven, uh, former Olympian for Cuba, I believe. He uh, wrestled in Greco-Roman. Um, he's a southpaw. He tro- loves, throws a lovely inside leg kick. Uh, He's very hard to take down himself, but he is very, very strong. So he's four foot eleven, but he's built, you know, he's built like Hector Lombard or <laughs> someone like that. He's really, really, really strong. Um, and he pushes you against the cage. Let's see, with someone obviously so small, with a, you know, it's, it's going to be the, straw, the strawweight division as well. Not the biggest power in the world and not that many finishes or anything like that. But the ability to kind of control the fight, the ability to kick from the outside like that and hit someone's leg when they don't want to come in against you because you're such a, so strong and such a good wrestler, it's it's a difficult proposition because at other weight classes, I, I think his skill set might struggle a bit, and which is funny because usually the smaller weight class, you look at Demetrius Johnson, if he was made into a bigger guy, he'd be unbeatable. We all know that. He's the pound-for-pound pound greatest fighter of all time, and I've said that for years and years and years. Whereas Ballart... A bigger version of Bilar probably wouldn't be as you know wouldn't be as good, but he uses his ability very very well. Um, Alex Silva then on, on the other side of it, um, ten stoppage wins all by submission. So there goes your, your more submissions as well. He's an aggressive striker to get the fight to the ground. One thing from him as well, very unusual for modern MMA. I would say loves upper body control on the ground. Loves a crucifix in a north south position. Most of his submissions are via armbar. Very old school grappler. He pulls guard as well sometimes, which is very interesting. I wonder will he do that against Ballart? You know who will be happy? I suppose to put the fight in the ground or will be happy to wrestle, even though he's a Greco Greco um, uh, upper body type of uh, of wrestler in the clinch and stuff. And that's very interesting as well. You know, the Greco is obviously upper body. Um, Silva likes to grapple with his upper body on the ground I wonder will he be able to do that against Bellart if the fight does get there so maybe the, the ability and the you know the um, the background of Bellart actually takes away the best part of Alex Silva's game I that's very interesting to me I, I, I would love to see this fight get to the ground and it be a jiu-jitsu matchup for a while in you know in half guard or inside control very very interesting for me um 
Alex Silva, not the best striker in the world. He was knocked out in the first punch of the second round of a couple of fights ago. Uh, it's He has zero interest in striking. And when I say zero interest in striking, I mean zero, zero, zero interest. He pulls guard, as I said, all over the place, goes for takedowns. He will not fight a striker match against Ballard or against anyone, I don't think. Now, maybe it'll be different against Ballard because of the size and stuff. Alex Silva is not, you know, he's not Francis Ngannou himself, man. <laughs> he's not that big or seven through or anything like that. But I wonder, will maybe the size advantage he does have over Ballard count to make him strike? I, I don't think it will. Uh, so I... I I, I honestly I don't know who's going to win this fight maybe the submission attacks of Bilar will be enough but I find it very hard for him to be able to control the fight where he wants to control the fight overall like I think it'll more than likely be a fight where uh, Silva tries his very very best to make it a grappling match where he catches him in something but I think Bilar won't be held down or won't be kept down and will probably end up winning a decision on the feet so that's I'm not sure. I'm not sure, honestly, but that would be my most likely outcome there. Uh, then we have Leandro Issa versus Artem Belak. Um, Issa, 11 subs, 2 KOs, so more submissions there again. Um, you know, we've seen him around for a long time, BJJ world champion. Um, he obviously, you know, as a, when you look at Issa, sorry, you, you look at his game, I think a lot of it, a lot of it is posture. Uh, and I think, you know, you you see some guys, they get into certain positions and they haven't the ability to kind of keep those positions. And, you know, we saw Issa in the UFC fighting, you know, a long time ago. And we saw, you know, he fought uh, Yuri Alcantara and Sasaki and a few others as well. And I think that's always kind of been his games. You know, he has a couple of submission wins in the UFC and uh, everywhere, he's, uh, everywhere he's been, basically. I think a lot of that is his ability to have that great posture, to pass so well, to to get to the mount, to attack from the mount with strikes from that posture, or to get arm bars as well. I, I, I think, and when I say posture, and it's not something I, I normally say about fighters a lot, because it's not something so evident to people, and it's a very, very good thing for a fighter to have, because if you have very good posture on the ground... And you can land a lot of strikes. It's going to open up arm bars. It's going to open up submissions more. And I think that is Issa's game to a T. Transitions to subs very well. Great reversals as well when taken down. Throws a lot of body kicks and right hands, hoping to get uh, the fight to the clinch. I wouldn't say he's the fastest or best striker in the world, but he, he knows what to do to get the fight to where he wants to get it to. Uh, Artem Balak, on the other hand, um, eight wins, seven submissions. Uh, training with Peter Yan now. I believe I was watching a video of him the other day. Uh, loves to catch legs for takedowns, uh, but he will wait for that takedown at him. He's heavy on top. Happy to settle and land ground and pound uh, in a different sort of way. Uh, when, when I said, you know, the posture of Isa, he's more of like a, a controlling top guy. Uh, when given a chance, he look for the transition and, and the submission as well. Very good. Uh, in his striking, a very good defensive jabber. Um... Keeps uh, he keeps his hands very high. Doesn't throw much, but likes to explode. Has a big flying knee in him. Touch a touch of the OL Ramirez about him in that way. You know, he kind of waits and waits and waits and waits for everything. Um, and I suppose Issa does too in a way. I I'm very interested to see the betting odds that that come out on this fight because um, you know Issa has the experience. He's 39 years of age now, you know, what is it, 25 fights, Balak is only 9 fights, he's only 26 years of age, you know, his first fight in one championship, um, he, I think he was supposed to fight in one championship before and then the fight fell through, um, and honestly, I, there isn't loads of tape <coughs> around on him, um, but what, from what I did see, I think that's... Uh, and the last thing I said about Balak there was the uh, the ability to land big strikes and to land fast strikes and that big flying knee and other things like that. The last thing I said about Issa is not the fastest striker in the world. Could that be the difference? Could, like, the speed of striking be the difference between the two of these? Maybe it could. Maybe it could be that. When both of them are so good on the ground, so good at dominating on top in different ways... And with the takedowns as well, could it turn into a striker match again? Maybe. Um, 
I'd be interested to see a lot of these fights, as I said, with a lot of submission wins for all guys in this. If it if they do turn into like wrestling or BJJ matches, who is going to have the better jiu-jitsu and is that going to be the difference? A lot of time in MMA today, it actually doesn't make the difference because neither person will be willing to fight that sort of fight. Whereas if we fight, find fights who, where both guys are willing to find out, we'll find out who's better. And I kind of hope that happens uh, a little bit here. Um... The last mixed martial arts fight uh, on the card um, is a very interesting uh, one championship flyweight uh, division fight. Uh, Echo Ronnie Sap- uh, Saputra, uh, who's <sighs> this guy, six early finishes in a row, massive power shots, very talented striker. Uh, he lo- loves to dip under, is a very good double leg, and he's known for his jiu jitsu. Excellent on the ground, quick finisher. Like, there isn't loads of tape on him just because he gets so many quick finishes. Um, uh, he's fighting uh, Yad Kaikeo Fairwax, whose name I absolutely butchered there. But we're going to call him Y2K because that's his nickname. Um, he's the only guy in the car with no subs. So he's a southpaw, brilliant straight left, huge uppercut from the clinch, knees in the clinch, very good. Makes the people think about the takedowns uh, when he hurts them in the clinch too. Really accurate with his strikes. He gets inside and lands short shots. Doesn't kick loads, but what he does have is a beautiful front kick to the face. He's landed it over and over and over again. Uh, one big issue he has here, I don't think he's the best takedown defense in the world. Good defensively on the ground when it gets there. Um, but I think this is a bit of a different level. I think this is a very, very tough matchup uh, for, for Mr. Fairtex. Uh, out of the Fairtex GM, obviously, Ekarani is very, very good. Could this be another early finish? I, I don't know. Um... Uh, Y2K is very, very good defensively, as I said, on the ground. Maybe it'll give him a little bit of trouble, but I don't think... I think this is going to be another win for Echo Rani here. And he's definitely a guy that people need to to keep an eye on. Um, You know, one championship of a lot of potential stars, I suppose, coming through. And he, for me, is absolutely one, uh, one of them. If you look at it, he's six wins... Four submissions, two knockouts, and his one loss was by knockout as well. That was in his very, very first fight. Uh, actually, I couldn't find a, a clip of that, uh, to be honest, but I, I saw the rest of his fights. They all ended in the first round. Uh, one minute 34, 10 seconds, four minutes, four, seven, two, 29, three, 35, 19 seconds in the first round. All first round. He's never seen a second round. So it'll be interesting to see. Look, I suppose if uh, he can be drawn in and, and brought further here, if he can kind of cope with that, but... Honestly, I don't see it. So I'm going for Echo Ronnie to win this one. Um, so yeah, I will leave it there for uh, the 162 preview. I will have another preview for the big uh, Amazon card this week, uh, which John Lineker is on and, and others as well. A very, very good card there as well. Um, so yeah, I will leave it there. Sean Sheehan here for Shardog.com and I will see you all next time.